Hello and welcome to Restoring the Soul, a podcast dedicated to helping you close the gap between what you believe and what you actually experience. I'm your producer, Brian Beatty. Thanks so much for listening. On this edition, Michael welcomes back our good friend, Philip Yancey. No author in contemporary Christian literature is more well-known for their writing on grace and suffering than Philip. He's authored over 25 books in which he's wrestled with God, with the church, and with fellow believers. Now, after surviving a church background of what he now calls toxic faith, he ultimately came to know a God of grace and beauty. Over the next two episodes, Michael and Philip discuss the major themes of his latest book, his memoir, titled Where the Light Fell. At its heart, this is a book about the possibility of healing and the hope that nothing in a person's life need go to waste. It's a fascinating read, and we trust the conversation will be equally as stimulating. Now, one final note, if you'd like to subscribe to Philip Yancey's blog, we've placed a link in the show notes. So without any further delay, here's your host, Michael John Cusick. So, Philip, uh, welcome to the program, and congratulations on your memoir, which you have described as the one book that you feel you were uh, put on earth to write. That's right, Michael, and it took me a long time to get to it, but I finally have, and it's it's kind of a prequel, actually, to everything else I've written. I, I did the backstory after I did the stories. Yeah, the old Star Wars prequel idea. I did not know this. Uh, I was. Uh, we went to church together for for about fourteen years. We were at that church, and we prayed for you when you were in your car accident. I think it was during the season when you're driving your Ford mm. Explorer, and you had a a near death experience. Right. And I didn't realize that that was what inspired you to and basically said, "I am going to write a memoir." Right. I had a broken neck, and it was in different pieces. And they were concerned that one of those pieces might have pierced my carotid artery. And so the doctor came to me and said, uh, here's the situation. And we have a jet standing by to fly you to Denver for emergency surgery. However, if indeed your carotid artery has been pierced, you won't make it to Denver. So here's a cell phone. Call the people you love and tell them goodbye just in case. And then uh, you're strapped down here. We're doing further scans, and uh, we'll get back to you. (laughs) So there I was, strapped down, couldn't move. My arms and legs were both strapped. And I I had one of those uh, review of life. Turned out to be seven hours in all when they were still trying to figure things out. I had been climbing the uh, 14ers. We call them 14,000-foot mountains in Colorado. There are 54. And at that point, I had climbed 51 of them. My first instinct, Michael, was, I can't die yet. I've got three mountains <laughs> left to climb. <laughs> and then, uh, more seriously, the second instinct was, okay, what if this is like my last day on Earth? What would be my regrets? You know, I've had a good life. I've written two dozen books, what what did I not get to that was really important to me? And this memoir came right to the fore. Uh, if I died without getting it down, I would feel like I hadn't spent my time on earth. And so my wife uh, supported that completely. And as soon as we could, I cleared the calendar and and concentrated on this task, which which took several years to do, actually. I, I mentioned this before we hit record, but uh, you and I had lunch up in the mountains near where you live, I think four years ago, maybe three, and you had told me about writing the memoir, and you hadn't gotten out of high school yet, and it was 120,000 words, and then as you share at the end of the book, it was over 200,000, right? Yeah, it ended up being 240,000 words. I I wrote down everything I could remember and needed some help. When I write other people's stories, it's just self-evident to me what's important, what's interesting, what's not. But in writing my own story, I didn't have that judgment. I I just wrote everything that I could remember. It was all of equal importance because it happened to me. (laughs) That was the filter. And I needed that outside help to say, well, Philip, you're... 
your crazy relatives here are kind of interesting, but they're more interesting to you than they are to us. So why don't you stick with your story and not your crazy relatives? <laughs> and, and that editing and paring it down uh, really served well because your story um, in the first half of the book, first two-thirds, is, uh, is so compelling. And maybe because I know you, but I was really emotionally moved by it. Uh, by your honesty and, hmm. frankly, the, the depth of pain and suffering. And for me, it put into context why you've spent your whole writing career writing about suffering and grace or, you know, the, the, the absence hmm. and then what can show up in its presence. Um, so what was it like for you to to go back and take inventory and to remember and to learn new stories from family and, and, and documents. What was it like to go back and do that? My wife was worried. I tend to go out in the, in the mountains alone for almost a week at a time when I'm in the writing mode. And I did that numerous times in writing this memoir. And she would know I'm, I'm going to be writing about something that summons up pain from the past and she'd be worried are you okay are you okay and i'd come back are you okay <laughs> and actually i found it to be a very healthy almost therapeutic exercise it was it was a way of stitching together my past and i know you deal with this all the time michael in your work um, both in the program of course in your therapy as well where people are well you call it restoring the soul um, a, a bruised, a wounded soul. I, I now see as a gift that I was set down in an extreme environment, an extreme fundamentalist environment, as extreme as, as anybody I know. I was saturated by the church. Here I was living in a tiny little mobile home trailer on church property. I could never get away from it. And it was a racist, angry, legalistic church. So I, I got that uh, immersion and a family that was rather unusual, that was way dysfunctional. A lot of your listeners have different degrees of those. Mine was pretty extreme. And in addition, I grew up during a rather chaotic time, the 1960s, when everything was kind of up for grabs. And I had a brother who went that route. So for a writer, that's great material. <laughs> you know, growing up, it didn't necessarily feel like material. It felt like uh, I got to somehow find a way to survive this. But as I look back, uh, you're absolutely right. This, the suffering and grace are the themes that emerge, and they've defined the rest of my life. And thankfully, grace is part of that. So I, I feel healed of many of those childhood wounds. They didn't they didn't plague me as I explored them and picked them apart. I just tried to render them. I'm not trying to make a point in this memoir. I'm trying to tell my story. And then in telling my story, it kind of makes sense of, of what happened after that. Some people have expressed disappointment that I end most of the action in my shortly after my college days. I don't, I don't talk about touring around the world, becoming a writer, any of those things. Um, it's more the the backstory, the prequel, the things that formed me and put me on this course, which has been in the public already for 40 years or so. Right. Well, but these stories have yeah, not been told. Yeah. If anybody know. reads the, the canon of what is now 25 or more books, uh, they'll they'll learn and hear and see that that part of your adult life as a writer, because so many of those stories are are told as you write about other topics. Um, let's talk about the context into which you were born. Um, you know, you you have a, a chapter called Trailer Trash, uh, and you, I think mm -hmm. in, you said, mid-elementary school, you realized suddenly that you were poor. Uh, so that poverty was there. There was the religious environment that was uh, toxic. But talk about losing your dad, because I previously interviewed for a podcast and you were very vulnerable and talked about that. But there's new information that you shared here that I, I had never heard. And it took me a while to hear that information as well. 
I grew up fatherless. I was 13 months old when my father died, so I have no conscious memories of him at all. And that defined our life. The poverty came out of that. My mother was ill-equipped, really had no income, and didn't know how to drive, Didn't had never written a check. So we had a pretty rough upbringing, and I, I have a lot of sympathy and compassion for her. She, she just wasn't ready for that kind of life. But there was, there was a shadow in the background that I didn't find out until I was 18 years old. I knew my father had polio. What I didn't know was how he died. And I found that out when my girlfriend at the time, who became my wife, was visiting my grandparents and she wanted to know, tell me about the Yanceys, tell me about some relatives. And they pulled out old scrapbooks. And as we were going through the scrapbooks, this yellowed newsprint paper fell out onto the floor and I picked it up. And it was a copy of the Atlanta Constitution, the major newspaper back then. And it had a story of my father and mother. And the story was that he had been in an iron lung for two months. I knew that. But he had been taken out of that iron lung against all medical advice because a bunch of people, including my mother and father, became convinced that he would be healed. So here he was paralyzed, unable even to breathe on his own. That's what the iron lung did for him. And they believed, no, God couldn't possibly take this 23-year-old man. He's going to be a missionary in Africa. He has an amazing but short track record as a Christian bringing others to Christ. And it just wouldn't make sense. So he's got to be healed. And they believed that and prayed for it and finally had the leap of faith to take him out of that iron lung and move into a clinic that had no machines like that. And the article was written while things were looking good. He thought he could move his toe for the first time. And and it was a much more pleasant environment. He had been in a charity hospital before. Now he's in a place where they tend to respond to summons. They had no machines, and I looked at the date of the newspaper, and it was but nine days before he died. And I realized what a crushing experience this must have been, that people decided, this is God's will. God will heal this man, and it turned out not to be true. And that worked itself out in, a, in dramatic ways in my mother, who I'm sure felt guilt, felt maybe a sense of betrayal, maybe anger, anger at God for letting her down. She really believed that God was going to heal her husband, and he didn't. And she she took that out by first offering her two sons, and I'm one of those, my brother's another, as a, as a replacement for their father, for our father who died. And that became, um, well, it was a solemn vow that later became almost a curse, certainly in my brother's case. And we never lived up to that vow. We never became missionaries in Africa, which was part of what the vow was. So she didn't really read my book. She doesn't approve of me, doesn't approve of my brother. And that started a whole chain of of unraveling, I would say, uh, in my mother during teenage days. And, and I describe a lot of those scenes. Some of them are are pretty tough scenes, but families are like that, aren't they? And it's in this case, there was that religious undercurrent. I, I've read books about people who become artists instead of rabbis, uh, in the, and Chaim Potak writes about that. And they're disowned. The father, in his case, didn't speak to him for years and years and years because he, be, he didn't become a rabbi. And that's kind of how we felt as well. We were given this script that we did not follow. And when we didn't follow it, we were completely rejected out of our own family. Well, there's no room in that context to become who you actually are. You know, you're, there's an identity that's prescribed to you. And yet, in the midst of that uh, vow and what became a curse, one of the things that stands out in the story is how providence allows you to uh, emerge. I mean, starting at four years old, and hmm. it was breathtaking. Uh, I've always known you're a brilliant man, but you taught yourself to read at four years old. And 
it was like Kaimpo Tak. He said, you know, his eyes were opened when he discovered literature and books, mm -hmm. and it forever changed his life. Right. But you taught yourself to read, and then you became someone who had this this currency of being able to to learn and uh, stood out suddenly, and, and and there was something that you could bring to the world. Yes, my brother and I had had dramatically different reactions. His reaction was, I'm going to get away from this environment as far as I can. I'm going to be the opposite of what I'm expected to be. And he did that. And I tell all those, not all of them, I tell a lot of the stories. He became one of Atlanta's first hippies. He dropped out of college his final semester. He should have been a concert pianist. He had amazing mus musical gifts. But instead, he ended up as a piano tuner, playing the same note over and over. He went to California. He got involved in uh, a lot of addictions, especially sexual addictions, and indeed succeeded in getting as far away from the way he was raised as a person could get. And I looked at that and saw that most of those choices turned out to be self-destructive choices. He, he wasn't better because of them. He was... He was enslaved. You know, he was seeking freedom. But what addictions do, they promise freedom, and then you end up being being a slave, a servant to the addiction. And, and I took a different uh, tack for, during high school years, I took the, the process of trying to be just as, I can't let them get to me. I can't let those people hurt me. And I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of people who, respond in different ways, some by self-harming and, and different ways. And mine was just to create a shell around myself so that nobody could hurt me, nobody could get to me. And then I do tell the story of, a, of an unexpected and even unwanted at the time conversion experience that changed my life. And that set me on a course. I decided that, that what I needed to do was separate out the fake from the real to... to figure out what of that past was worth keeping and what I should discard. And that's what I've been doing in my books for four decades, picking up who is Jesus, what is grace, does prayer really work? You know, one, one by one, these parts of faith that I grew up with, but I can't swallow the way I was taught originally. So how, how can I separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were? And that's been my whole career as a writer. And I've always related to that. Uh, the, the suffering and grace as the bookends. And then it feels like what is in between those bookends is the lens that you have from your own story of toxic faith and in suffering and mm -hmm. grace. How do we integrate the toxic faith into uh, healthy Christian spirituality around the person of Jesus? And I've always appreciated how uh, the very first book I read by you, and I know it wasn't your first book, was Disappointment with God. And it was actually uh, mm. a required text for a moody lay counseling program that I was in. And Wow. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> um, and it had just come out. Remember, you wrote about Harold, which is probably a, a fictional name. Uh, I believe that was the name 30, 30 plus years ago. But, but I thought, wow, someone is putting words to my experience where I had been a Christian and it was true mm -hmm. and I believed it, but my experience was something very different. And I was disappointed, if not with God, but with the Christian faith. And, you know, my, my whole career has been a working out of that gap between the belief mm -hmm. and the experience. So I want to talk for a minute about toxic faith. And if you're uncomfortable with that term, I'd love to hear what word you use. But it felt to me like there could be no better time uh, in my lifetime or your lifetime for this book to be written uh, than this time that we're undergoing in America, where faith is defined so much as political affiliation and as certain stances that seem to be toxic in relation to people and uh, the, the unifying of people. So... How do you describe this this experience of faith uh, that, as you said in a previous conversation, vaccinated you uh, to to faith? Hmm. Well, I just wrote a blog about that, and in that blog, I went back to Jesus last night with his disciples. He had spent three years on Earth, and then he said, "Okay, I've done my my job; <laughs> it's finished." 
So I'm turning everything over to you guys. And there's a beautiful passage, one of the most beautiful ones in the whole Bible, from John 13 to 17. Nowhere else do we get that kind of in-depth, close-up look at Jesus talking and the conversation and the interaction with disciples. Sometimes he kind of cuts them off because they're so dense. But this time, every time they'd pose a question, he would take it seriously. He'd answer it. And he's, he's really turning everything over to them. And I, I went back and looked at that, and it seemed to me that he, he emphasized three things. First, servanthood. He washed their feet, and he said, that, this is what you're supposed to do for the world. You're supposed to wash their feet. You're, you're not here for them to serve you. You're here to serve them. And then the mark of the Christian is love, he said, and unity. If, I, if there's one thing that I want, it's that the church would be one like my body, so that people would look at you and say, I, I want to be like them. They have a unity that I've not experienced. So service and love and unity. And I mentioned many times I've, I've asked strangers, like on an airplane or in a bus station or something, when I say the word Christian or if I say the word evangelical, what's the first word that comes to mind? No one has ever, <laughs> ever come close to saying any of those mm-hmm. words, love, service, or unity. They usually talk about, oh, these uh, maybe holier than thou, or uh, now they would say uh, usually political frame. Those are the people who voted for Trump. You know, 81% of evangelicals voted for Trump, so they must be Republicans. Or sometimes uh, anti-words, anti-science, anti-gay, anti-sex. And it, it seems like we... We should be taking seriously what Jesus said about this is the way the world should perceive you. This is the way you should be defined by the world. Instead, today, you're absolutely right. Uh, The church is known for its divisions. And it makes me sad. When the pandemic happened, this was a, a phenomenon that affected almost every person on earth, one way or another, either economically or, of course, many died. If there was ever a call for Christians to show those qualities of love and service, unity, it would be during a pandemic like that that affects the whole world. Instead, we just added to the anger and the division. I've talked to so many pastors who say, there are lots of people in my church who will never come back because of our policy on vaccines or masks. And it's on both sides, you know, some have a strict policy, so I'm have a loose policy. And and when I grew up, uh, so much was dominated by fear and shame. Those were the characteristics I took away as a child from that toxic church. And so we heard about hellfire and damnation and sin week after week after week. We were just beaten down, and then we kept coming back. We didn't hear much about grace, and we didn't hear much about how our faith should affect this life. It was about getting through this life, kind of gritting your teeth. If I could just get through, and and if that salvation took, you know, like an immunization, then I could escape hell and go to heaven, and then uh, then then everything would be okay. And that was our primary goal in life. And and so I didn't know how to live as a Christian. And I go back later, and and Jesus says, I came to bring you the truth, and the truth will set you free. I came to give you an abundant life, life to the fullest. He says those kinds of things. And it was so different from what I heard growing up. I I didn't think we had an abundant life. I thought we were all shrinking because everybody else got to do things I wasn't Mm -hmm. allowed to do. And just the controls of the the fear and shame that... Uh, fundamentalism plays on the fear of the second coming, fear of Armageddon, fear of Y2K, and and it, that's still going on. Fear of masks, fear of vaccines. Uh, it, it seems the fear is still there. We just plug in different things to be afraid of over the years. Very sad to me. And I imagine that that's been going on for 2,000 plus years, uh, not only in Christianity, but before that in Judaism and most other religions, whether mm. it's... Uh, jihadist sure. Islam, where it's extreme. And so you really have right. something to say right. about extremism in religion. And in your blog, and I, I read that blog, and at the end of our podcast, I want to tell people how to 
sign up for that blog through your website, philipyancy.com. Um, and those come monthly or sometimes more frequently. But you talked about three elements of an unhealthy church or a toxic church. Uh, one of them was rigidity. So can you comment on how that rigidity plays out? And, and of course, these are all three opposite of servanthood and the John 13 to 17 passage that you read. Right, exactly. Yeah, the rigidity, last I heard, there were at least 45,000, some now say 54,000 denominations in the world. And you play that against Jesus' call for unity, and we're known as the divided ones, our, our faith. No other religion has that many different divisions and sects and, and denominations. And why are there? Well, a guy, and it's usually a guy, not a woman, <laughs> One day decides, I've got more truth than all those other denominations. They've got a lot of things right, but I've got even more things right. So I'm going to start my own. And instead of getting along with people who see things a little bit differently than we do, what we do is splinter off and say, we've got the truth. And I grew up in that uh, rigid environment, and it was all tightly tied together. The problem with that is when everything's all tightly tied together and the, and the leaders are saying, this is truth, you got to believe it this way. When one little part of that cracks apart, then it makes you question everything. So for me, the primary issue was race. And I grew up in a time when the civil rights movement was just getting underway in the 60s in Atlanta, which is one of the main fo focus, foci of the civil rights movement. And my church was on the wrong side. My my pastor would would joke about Martin Lucifer Kuhn instead of Martin Luther King, and 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 we were taught that that the black races, the dark races, were cursed by God. This crazy theory out of Genesis nine, which is uh, has no basis, but has been abused to used to abuse people of color. And I found out that wasn't true, that the things they taught me were just flat out wrong, that actually there were people of color who who could be CEOs, even the President of the United States. And when when that crack opened, it, it opened a wide crack because I started to thinking, well, if they were wrong about race, maybe they're wrong about the Bible. Maybe they were wrong about Jesus. And, and it caused me to start questioning. And ever since then, you referred to disappointment with God, Michael. Ever since then, I, I've been on, tried to be on the side of the skeptics, of the questioners. I think uh, one of the things I appreciate most about the Bible is that God seems to be on the side of the skeptics. To think that he would in, put books like Ecclesiastes and Job and a lot of the Psalms of Lament that make God look bad. Where are you, God? Why, why was I ever born? You know, that kind of angry lament about the condition of the world. God puts that in, in the Bible. He, he's not afraid of our shaking our fists. He, he includes that, knowing that there are going to be times when faith is hard. And, and God welcomes honest dialogue, welcomes times of doubt. It's, it's there. He gives us the words to use. He knows something about the human experience. He created humans, after all. And we believe, as Christians, that he tasted of that human experience. He Hebrews is so clear about that. He, he found out what it was like to be a human being. He understands that we are but dust. Um, I think that rigid box that many people feel trapped in, it, it works until one little crack appears and then it can fall apart. And for some people I, that I hear from a lot, I, I hear there are as many as 25 to 30 million ex-evangelicals in our country, people who were raised in that environment. Maybe they had some nice nostalgic experiences about young life or a summer camp or something like that. But maybe they saw how a person who was divorced or a person who was gay was treated in their church and they thought they can't be right. And, and so gradually they drifted away. And they don't know how to separate out 
what God gave us and what we've added to it, what we've, we've put on top of it. And I, it's taken me most of my life to try to figure out some of those things myself, and that's what I try to do in my writing. You may not have uh, had this term. It's certainly not a just a, a, a modern uh, word. But now, all over Twitter and social media, hashtag deconstruction. And because of some writing that I'm doing to that audience, I'm kind of smack in the middle of that audience. And I didn't use that word in my journey, uh, but it was certainly an attempt to create a cohesive story. But would you consider what you Mm -hmm. went through when you started to question and to question whether it was all true and real? Would you consider that a kind of deconstruction? Yes, I've read various things about deconstructing, and it, some of it gets pretty complicated. I like very much the pattern that Richard Rohr sets out. He says we go through three stages, order, disorder, and reorder. And order, for him, was being raised in, in rigid Catholic doctrine pre-Vatican II, and he believed everything they told him. And for me, it was being raised in fundamentalism, and I believed everything they told me. And then there came a period of disorder where I realized, no, some of it's wrong. Maybe all of it's wrong. And I threw it up in the air. And eventually, uh, through God's grace, still found myself in the kingdom. But I I had to put it back together in a different way. And that's the reorder part. And I think everybody goes through that to some degree. Uh, Very few people believe exactly what their parents believed and what their church, their childhood church believed, we sift through. We, that's a healthy thing. We should be doing that. And for me, that's easier to grasp than some of the complicated deconstruction theories, just order, disorder, and then reorder. And as I say, I, I feel blessed and privileged that I've actually made my living by doing that reorder stage, <laughs> by doing it in print, and to my surprise, other people uh, have gone through something similar, and and I've been able to make a living as a writer for people who are going through their own reordering process. In addition to Richard's uh, order, disorder, reorder, first time I read that, it resonated with Walter Brueggemann's uh, orientation, disorientation, reorientation, which he writes about in his book yeah. on the Psalms. And so I kind of put those two together, and... I, I like to think of that disorder, instead of what people think is a regression or a loss of faith, that it's actually a growth spurt. Uh, just like how when babies become toddlers and they're kind of fumbling with their steps, or when they're crawling and then they learn how to stand, or when uh, a prepubescent uh, seventh grader starts to develop their upper body or their legs and arms are gangly. And that growth spurt is unfamiliar and it can be awkward and might even affect how we do life, but that it's potentially forward moving and in the faith world that it's the same way. And I think that because of your books and the gift that you've given people when you say you're on the side of the skeptic because God is, is that if more people had permission to have skepticism, to doubt as part of the journey of faith, Mm. that deconstruction would not necessarily be this pathological problem in the church, and it it wouldn't be something that so often ends badly. You know, I won't name names, but famous people who have walked away from their faith and said, I'm no longer a believer, or I'm an atheist, and that's happening more and more, Mm -hmm. and it seems like that's happening not because of the conclusion they've made for in a foregone way, but because of the process where there's people that push back, that reject, that say that that's unacceptable. And there's not a lot of uh, help or solidness with the reconstruction part of that conversation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, thank you that you're, you're doing that even in your memoir. Yeah. Yes, You mentioned earlier a book I wrote pretty early in my career, Disappointment with God. And the publisher was pretty nervous about that title. They said, you go in Christian bookstores, and there are a lot of books on the Christian secret to a happy life and things like that. (laughs) We don't have any books on Disappointment with God. You you sure you don't want to call that having overcome Disappointment with God? Or No, no, I want to reach people who are actually disappointed. And 
We talked about fear earlier, Michael, and there's a wonderful verse in First John that says, perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. And if if we are living in a fear-based environment, if that's what we're hearing week after week in our churches, then we're really distrusting God because we're we're walling off that perfect love. We're we're saying, I, I don't trust God with how this is going to turn out. I don't trust God with my life. I, I'm gonna just go through life afraid and ashamed and and always on edge. And I don't think I'm sure that's not what Jesus had in mind for us. So thank you for listening to another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. What we're all about is helping couples and individuals get unstuck. You know how some people go to counseling or marriage therapy for months or even years and never really get anywhere? Our intensive programs help clients get unstuck in as little as two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com. Thank you.